Our last episode covered the mass extinction event which divides the Permian and Triassic periods. It was such an extreme event, the worst cataclysm in the history of the world, that it really divides the Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras. The Paleozoic began with the Cambrian explosion and saw the formation or derivation of many different categories of plants and animals that no one's ever seen alive because 96% of those species on land or at sea were wiped out in that disaster. That's only one survivor for every couple dozen that died. The few that made it through didn't just repopulate the world, they diversified into new forms and either created new jobs to do or restaffed positions that had previously been occupied by very different things. Remember that the Permian was a complete ecosystem with widely varied species of therapsids filling every necessary niche, but only a handful of these were still alive in the Triassic. A couple Dysonodont species survived the Permian extinction and were by this time still occupying the niche of grazing cattle, on every continent around the world in fact. So that hadn't changed yet, but it would by the end of the Triassic, roughly 51 million years later, probably due to increased competition. The same goes for crocomanders, those giant crocodile-like amphibians like Mastodonsaurus, which also made it through the Permian extinction. There still weren't any actual crocodiles yet, but the ancestors and cousins of crocodiles were already looking an awful lot like that, and they soon proved to be too much to cope with or compete against. The Triassic is the first of three periods of the Mesozoic era, better known as the Age of Reptiles, because that group saw the most diversification at that time. True reptiles had already divided into Lepidosaurs and Archosaurs, and now both of these main forks in the reptile family tree were flowering into new forms that were bigger, stronger, faster, and often stranger than anything before them. For example, uh, Unotosaurus, that lizard-like thing with the extra wide ribs that we saw in the Permian, apparently led eventually to turtles. Their evolution is represented here, beginning with Papa Kelly showing off those broad-bladed ribs. Then subsequent species like Odinokelys added a plastron, a shell on the underside only. Later species such as Proganokelys reinforced those ribs with a carapace or top shell composed of osteoderm scutes. They also lost their teeth at this point and really looked like turtles, but they weren't quite there yet. Finally, Chinlochelys fused the carapace onto the ribs and made a complete shell by joining it with the plastron too. Thus began the true lineage of turtles. At about that same time, another group called Placodonts did something similar. Some of them also developed shells and osteoderm scoots and looked very much like turtles, and they weren't the only ones to do that as there was another lineage trying to turtle too. So it's important to understand that even though any automotive company can build a vehicle that looks exactly like a Jeep, it's not a Jeep unless it was made by Jeep. So placodonts and such could look like turtles, but that doesn't make them turtles. They didn't act like turtles either. They didn't swim well. They had thick, heavy bones that made them about as buoyant as bricks. So they plodded along shallow tide pools and used their unusually powerful teeth to crush the shells of crustaceans. And some of the placodonts that looked most like turtles likely anchored themselves to the sea floor to defend against predators. Even in the Permian, we saw a few different lineages of reptiles returning to the sea, webbing their toes and turning their feet into flippers. Thus, in the early Triassic, we already have notosaurs, ancestors of the later plesiosaurs. We also see another transitional species in Capturinchus, the earliest ichthyosaur ever yet discovered. This little four-flippered reptile had flexible wrists, meaning it could hobble about on land like a seal. Descendant species, however, were more like dolphins, obligate swimmers with rigid wrists unable to move around on land at all. Over time, they developed a crook in their tails that turned into flukes. They eventually sported a dorsal fin too, and some of them grew to be enormous. Lepidosaurs diversified as well. Where the Tuatara is the only surviving Rancocephalian today, there were dozens more species in the fossil record. So there were a number of lizard-like things in the Triassic, and finally the first actual lizards showed up too, leading to thousands and thousands of species. Among them, Longosquama, which had a row of dorsal spines probably used in mating displays like the tail of a peacock. Although somehow some people thought these scales were feathers, and they imagined that Longosquama could flutter by like a butterfly. No. On the archosaur side, it was the same story with rapidly flowering diversity, beginning with weirdos like Tanistrophus and others revealing the shape of things to come, and Garjana with that huge head. Reminds me of a cartoon. This protosaurian group also included trypanosaurs, monkey lizards with prehensile tails and claws indicating a lifestyle like that of arboreal anteaters, and Charovipteryx, which had wing membranes on its hind legs. And somehow these were suspected of giving rise to pterosaurs, which also appeared in the Triassic, along with the first dinosaurs. 
Finally, 21 episodes into the series, and we're just now getting to the first dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Though they weren't the big ones yet. These are just the little ones, the beginner set. The only archosaurs that are still alive today are birds and crocodilians, and some people have a hard time understanding how these two groups could be related. They don't know that birds are a subset of dinosaurs. So they didn't just come from dinosaurs, they're still dinosaurs right now. And that crocodilomorphs weren't always as we see them now. Remember that most of them died out with the classic dinosaurs, and those ambush predators lurking in the shallows along the shore today are just one of many varieties that used to be. The crocodilomorph clan once included fully marine fish mimics, fully terrestrial armadillo mimics, plant eaters, and even arboreal tree climbing predators, if you can imagine that. There were also some that walked on their hind legs, and of course those crocodilomorphs looked an awful lot like the first dinosaurs. Remember that one of the laws of evolution is the further back in time you look, the more similar different lineages will be to each other because they were once the same thing and have since grown apart. So at some point, some ancient archosaur like the early Triassic Euparcaria was the ancestor of both crocodilomorphs and Cruertarsians, which include dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Now, one thing they didn't have in the Triassic, ironically, was crocodiles. Toward the end of that period, there were protosuchans that were not quite crocodiles. In fact, they were nimble, long-legged, high-speed runners, holding their lithe, slender bodies high off the ground like wolves, not at all like the body style of crocodilians as we know them now. What they did have instead of crocodiles were phytosaurs, an earlier branch of archosaurs that looked an awful lot like crocodiles, except that their nostrils were up by their eyes instead of on the ends of their snouts. And some of them got up to 40 feet long, much bigger than the biggest crocs we have today. So there's every kind of reptile to fill every vacant position, and even new ones now that we have the reptilian equivalent of birds and whales too. But back on our own family tree, not much has changed. Thrinaxodon is still creeping around like Grandpa, griping about the good old days when reptiles were small and easy to eat. His lineage didn't change very fast, but it is continuous enough that comparing older and newer fossils is like looking at stop-motion animation. You can see the same changes taking place across successive generations of species that are definitely, literally, in transition. The new breed includes things like Sinonathus, whose name implies that these were all vaguely dog-like. They probably look more like weasels than dogs, really. It's amazing what some people will confuse with dogs. And these weren't really dogs in any sense. They were more like the marsupial thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger, in that they looked kind of like dogs on the outside. On the inside, everything's different. We'll talk more about that in a later video. Today we'll look at what we have in common with Probanonathans and Chinaquodontids of the mid to late Triassic. They're not mammals yet, but you'd have to study them real close to know that. They sure look the part, much more than anything else we've seen so far. You definitely wouldn't confuse these with reptiles. And remember that reptiles have a jaw made of a few different bones fused together, where the whole mammalian jaw is just one single bone. So if you look at the inside of the jaw of this Probanonath, or Chinacodont, who knows, both groups look very similar. Notice that the remnants of the other bones are no more than thin slivers. They're not even structural anymore. And in this view, they're just tiny vestiges right at the base of the ear, where they still are in us. Again, we'll talk more about that in a later video. As you can see, the ribs are more mammalian in that they're only thoracic. So feel your bottom ribs. It's the same thing. We don't have lumbar ribs anymore. They don't go all the way down to the pelvis like they do in reptiles. And the ribs are laterally expanded, another mammalian adaptation, which will come up again later. So do you accept that if we fit all the descriptive criteria and evident transition in addition to the suite of traits already listed in previous episodes, that it's fair to class us as Chinacodontid probanodathans? Fortunately, you don't have to be able to say that to understand it. 